Welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian, Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, and me, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker. Susie Etishamzadeh was born in Washington, D.C. to an Iranian father and an American mother. She moved to Iran at age five and grew up in Tehran under the Shah. She returned to the U.S. to attend Stanford University, and when the Islamic Revolution started brewing shortly after she graduated, she moved back to Iran and plopped herself down in it. She later received an MFA in creative writing from Boston University, A lifelong English teacher, she's taught in schools and universities on three continents, and she now lives in the United States. Her fiction has been published in numerous publications, including the Georgia Review, Gertrude Press, and Fiction International, and she received an honorable mention for the Best American Short Stories 2018. Her latest book, Zahn, A collection of short stories is published in 2024 by Zank Books and was the winner of the 2022 Zank Short Collection Prize. Welcome, Susie. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Did I pronounce the name of the book correctly? Um, It's actually Zan, not Zan. So it's a Zan. Thank you. Yeah. Great. So we usually ask when, when an author starts writing, but you have lived in so many vastly different places. I'm tempted to ask where you started writing. What country or culture gave you the most support for your fiction writing? Well, my fiction, obviously, most of it is based in Iran. So my my childhood was, you know, I had a very, very rich childhood, which was, uh, you know, formed deep wells of inspiration for me. Um, you know, playing in my grandfather's um, <laughs> orchard, um, riding donkeys, so on and so forth. Um, I guess that's where it all began. And I actually started writing in Iran, I guess, as a teen. I was a sort of a consummate diary keeper um, and... You know, my my diary entries later turned in, turned turned into something different, but um, yeah, I guess my really serious writing began as an adult living in the United States when I started to actually think about the idea of publishing. Um, so you know, I'm I'm a latecomer to the world of, of fiction writing. I didn't get my MFA until I was 59 years old, so that's that's odd. <laughs> so and it's odd to have a debut collection when you're 67. So, um, but I I own that proudly. Um, you know, it's never too late, right? <laughs> so yes, but um, it, I, I'm not sure I answered your question. Where did I begin writing? I think I've written all over the place. So <laughs> yeah, I also moved to Spain. Um, you know, in as uh, in my 20s um and Spain was sort of a happy medium between my two cultures if that makes sense it was sort of geographically and culturally somewhere in between the United States and and Iran and I felt very comfortable there from from the outset so um and you know there was there's also a lot of inspiration derived from my years in Spain so yeah You cover a wide range of states of being human. Is that why you wanted to tackle many different perspectives with the short story format? Um, I guess the best answer to that question is that Iran, which I'm writing about in this book, is is not a monolith. You know, (laughs) obviously, the only thing people in the Western world really pay attention to in Iran is, is, well, most recently, of course, the women's struggle. Um, And you know, and then, and then the whole hijab issue, which is huge, of course. But you know, there have also been labor movements in Iran, and there have also been, you know, um, you know, economic struggles, and there have also been all kinds of of, of other issues that have um, all forms of oppression and um, you know struggles uh, um, that that people have engaged in. So, um, and you know, I grew up as sort of privileged, um, I guess you would say, but I was very aware that <laughs> you know I was very aware of people of other economic class, socioeconomic classes, and and what they were enduring. Um, so I want to cover as, as broad a base as I can, if that makes sense, or cast as wide a net as I can, because Iran is a very complex place, a very layered society um, with, with many different kinds of, <laughs> of issues. Yeah. 
In your preface, you talk about why you chose to write about challenging topics such as abuse, cultural dislocation, and prejudice in fiction. Would you like to share a short overview of that? I think one of the things I'm trying to do in my preface is um, is not not to apologize or offer a disclaimer, but um, to to make it clear that I don't feel I represent all women in Iran because I have lived abroad for so long. Okay, um, and you know I'm doing my best to do justice to these amazing women I grew up with and the amazing women who are very courageously fighting for their rights right now. Um, but I don't feel I can adequately speak for all of them. So um, that, that's really what my preface is about. Let's see if there's a part of it I can, I can share. Okay, well, I'm just going to read the first paragraph. In my role as a teacher of literature, I have often been confronted with questions about the value of fiction. My answer always includes a variation on the famous line about fiction being, fiction being less strange than reality. This is something I wholeheartedly believe, and it is the reason I write. Like all writers, I grapple with reality when I put words on a page and part of what drives me is a desire that is more palpable and easier to absorb not only for my reader but for myself this in simple terms has been the impetus behind the stories in zen so i wrote that i i also could could reach some point of understanding and and um you know uh, uh, respect for what's going on in iran so um it was you know it was a process of uh, i i did lots of research i did a lot of reaching out i did a lot of reaching back in my memory um and yeah i've tried very hard to be as <laughs> i don't know as uh, faithful to to the situation as possible and um yeah also while also not claiming to speak for all of it so um and you mentioned abuse i i'm i'm not sure i really have stories that deal with abuse per se unless you're talking about political abuse and oppression and suppression um one of my goals is that I, I, I grew up frustrated with the tired narrative about the Iranian or the Muslim in general, Muslim women, women being oppressed and repressed and suppressed and depressed. Um, so I, I try to cast a different light on the Iranian women that they are, they are, they are many of those things. Certainly they are oppressed and suppressed and repressed, but they are also feisty and they're self-aware and they are strong and they are um, very courageous. So um, that that's one of my goals to do, to, uh, to paint that portrait or to adjust the, the, the standard portrait a little bit. A couple of times you provide end notes right at the bottom of the page of a story, which is kind of a, a unique structural approach. Mm -hmm. um, why did you want to include them with the fiction text rather than maybe at the end of the book, which would have been, you know, maybe more common? Question. It was kind of my editor's choice, um, especially with the story Stealthy Freedom. Um, the title is a bit odd, but the, that title of that story comes from an actual Facebook page uh, called My Stealthy Freedom. I'm not sure whether you have heard of it, but it. Um, it has quite a following, um, and she just thought it was important that I that I explain that that I explain where the title comes from, um, and I thought that that footnote was interesting. Um, putting it there does feel a little bit like an odd choice, especially because there's only one other place where I've got a footnote. Um, you know, someone told me the other day that my writing was was a little journalistic, and I think it might be. I mean, like I said, I I, I have done some research for it, and I do. Um, I, there there is a lot of. Um, I don't know. There's there are there are a lot of facts in it. I think, and I want to be as accurate as possible about those. The other place where I have a footnote is in the story of Abel Hamle, which is about refugees. Um, and I think there, I the the choice of that footnote was I I wanted to make that reality known because it is a reality that, that we don't pay enough attention to, and it's a a very uh, tragic one. So yeah. Uh, and also that story um, sticks out a little bit because it's the only story where the, the protagonist is actually not Iranian. She's Afghan, but she's an Afghan woman who has come come to, to Lesbos, Greece through Iran. So she identifies as, sort of as Iranian. So, yeah, I just, it just felt like and it also felt like one footnote wasn't good and I needed a second one. <laughs> so I, I'm not really sure that, um, if I answered the question adequately, but putting the, the just two foot, footnotes at the end of the book would also feel a little weird. So, yeah. But those stuck out to you, obviously. So um, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Did, did you feel I needed more or or they could go all together or? No, no, it was just a just a, just a choice because um, we like to delve into how a book is 
is put together as much as how it's written as as well. So we're just interested in, in various choices, and and uh, we often sometimes just literally ask about layouts. Right, right. <laughs> just, well, that's that's my honest answer. That's how those footnotes came to be. So yeah, that's a great answer and and a nice insight into working with an editor for sure. So in the story, the baboon. And a couple of other times, you describe a woman literally changing her clothes to bridge the dissociation and even time warp, if I should say, of not living within a, a certain culture for a long time. It's almost as if home is alien and the clothing is a sign of this sense of not belonging anymore, maybe. Um, what are some of the other ways that you have signaled this cultural separation, do you think? Oh, gosh, oh, I think it's all over the place in the story. It's something that I live almost on a daily basis, um, not not really knowing where my home is and where I belong. And I think the back of my book said something about women who continue to suffer oppression, women who are crafting new identities in the States and women who hover in between. And I'm sort of in the in between category where I'm I'm hovering between cultures. I'm a, I'm a consummate culture straddler. <laughs> I've done that for for most of my life. Um, I, I think it really is all over the place. It's in, uh, you know, it's, it's in the actions that my characters take. It's in the fact that I have a character who is a burlesque dancer, even though she is Iranian. Um, I have characters who struggle to remember words from their language or to struggle to translate those words into English or find find equivalents, equivalent uh, expressions in English for them. Um, that story, though, the, the baboon, the beginning of it is, is uh, literally, and it's actually one of the things I was planning to read that a, a, a brief sequence from that story. It's literally a, ca a character who's hovering over <laughs> in between two cultures about to return to her homeland after many years away and feeling very out of place, both places. Um, so, yeah. Um, and, you know, there are many, many um, Iranian Americans who will relate very much to, because we are diasporans. We are people who were sort of not forced or in some cases forced, but in many cases chose to leave our countries and, you know, haven't necessarily found a home in our new in our adopted country. It's a little different for me because my mother is American. And so I, I grew up um, with a lot of American culture in Iran. But yeah, um, but I see a lot of Iranian women who struggle with that all the time. So your characters, especially the elders, often speak in metaphors to emphasize the difference between Iran and North America, like the father in Azadi. Were these phrases picked up from your own family life and lived experience and or other literary inspirations from either region? OK, um, absolutely. From my own life and experience, uh, you know, these stories, uh, they may seem symbolic and metaphorical in a lot of places, but they are so rooted in things that I went to, through. And the, the father in Azadi is so much like my own father. Um, and I'm not sure which phrase in particular you're talking about and the, the whole the whole um, sort of deconstruction of the word Azadi and the places that it appears. Um, conversations like that have have been sort of regular dinner table fare <laughs> throughout my life. So um, um, as far as my literary influences, I, I'm, I imagine that you're going to ask that question or did you just ask it right now? <laughs> That's a tough one. I hate that question, but I, um, <laughs> because there's- I mean, the, the question did include a bit of like, did other literary inspirations from either region contribute to the kind of metaphors and phrases that you were using? Oh, I see. Um, I really, they're not rooted in literature so much as in 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 daily conversation. They they're you know, Iranians speak a, a, a sort of pidgin Farsi. Iranian Americans are Iranians who have some you know some connection to to um, to English speaking cultures. Really, they throw they sprinkle their their Farsi with a lot of English expressions. It's very very common. Um, yeah, and the opposite happens for for you know I hear in the United States where we're constantly reverting to the Farsi word because there is no English equivalent. So, yeah, um, it's it's a hard it's a hard balance balancing act, and to to put that in dialogue in a book, I'm not sure how well it works. But um, yeah, so. Women academics and educators feature prominently in the collection. What are some of the unique challenges that these women face and how did you approach illustrating their inner lives? So how do, challenges that women educators and intellectuals face um, if they are Iranian American? 
Yeah. Um, you know, when you are in a classroom, in front of a classroom, that's sort of a pulpit, and you do have to be very careful what you say, and you have to be very careful how you phrase it, and you have to be very careful how it will be, be received by your audience. Um, that's something I, I have struggled with living in the United States, because I am a very political person. I'm sure you can see that in my stories, and I've had to keep my big mouth shut a lot of times in the classroom, especially in the aftermath of 9-11, when I was here living in the United States and teaching. Um, it's it's, it's hard. It's hard when you've got an ideology that doesn't necessarily dovetail or, or mesh with the ideology of the culture that you are living in. And you, yeah, you've, you've got to navigate that. So, um, yeah, that, that's an excellent question. I'm not sure exactly how to answer it, but it's, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad that you picked up on that because, you know, I am an educator and I'm, an, uh, and so, yeah, that you're right that those, those women feature prominently in, in the book. Many of my characters are, are teachers and I keep telling myself, I need to have a character that's not a teacher, but of course that's what I'm familiar with. So yeah, that happens. Mm -hmm. I love stories set in the English department of any place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So also married life and all variations of relationships, same sex couples, multiculturally diverse relationships. And again, those strained by the distance from children as they adopt new cultures. How did you decide to attribute those relationships to your characters? Have you had any feedback about these depictions? Mm, depictions of relationships. Um, I have I have heard from friends and readers that I'm not very charitable to the American male. <laughs> I hope that's not true. I think I have a few good American men characters because some of them come across as a bit doltish or something at times. Um, I, I think, um, you know, because I am married and I've struggled in my own marriage at times with, with you know, with cultural um, misunderstandings, I think. Um, and the story married life actually is, is, is derived from my own marriage. Um, so, yeah, I, I haven't had anybody tell me that they are uncomfortable with those depictions. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I try to make them as accurate as possible. And again, they are, most of them are, are derived from either my own experience or experiences of, of Iranian women I know, you know, um, so... And it, it's difficult. All relationships are difficult. Let's face it, you know. But it, but a, a, when when a cultural, <laughs> um, you know, different cultures are thrown into the mix, it's, it becomes especially different, uh, difficult. And then when when you know gender identity issues also come into it, it makes it even more more difficult. And so, um, yeah. And I think maybe some of those relationships are uncomfortable. I'm not sure. I've been told that I write well about sexuality, although I, I'm I'm very prudish about it. I I have a, a 35 year old daughter who tells me I'm very prudish in the way I deal with sexuality, <laughs> which is funny because I'm sure my mom would say, oh my goodness, what are you, you know, how are you writing about this? So yeah, um, and it, it's it's hard to write about, about sex in general. Um, you know, one of my professors at BU told me, if you're going to write about sex, it needs to be awkward. It should always be awkward. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, relationships are, are, are complex things, you know, um, so you also very movingly depict relationships within fractured families, like the grandfather in Dying in America as he tries to connect with his children and grandchildren. Could his death have begun when his wife insisted that they leave Iran to live in the United States and raise their children there? Yes, very much so. That is probably where it began. I don't, did I not say that? I probably didn't say that. I think, I think it was maybe implied, but yes, definitely. Um, um, because that father, like my own father is, 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 is very, um, I don't know, his, his, uh, his Iranianness is so sacred to him. And um, there's no way that that could not be compromised or even violated when you move to another country, you know, um, and, and have to adapt and have to become American and have to, you know, in order to survive. So um, yeah, yes, very much. Mm -hmm. There is such a concept as immigrants grief, isn't there? So what was it like for you as you depicted these losses in your work? How did you approach that topic and protect yourself as you were engaging with that content? 
immigrants grief is a is a powerful way to put it and i i i think that's that's very much a thing um it isn't so much one for me because i have had the privilege of of traveling back and forth um and you know i was born in the united states and then raised in iran and then i i, I have gone back and forth quite a bit um but I, I i know a lot of a lot of iranian diasporans like i said who who are still grieving you know um and yeah i i won't say that i didn't cry while writing this book. I did a lot. And I, I even cry when I read it over again, you know. Um it it is it it's it's heartbreaking and painful. And it's it's it is part of the human condition in the 21st century, is it not? You know, I mean, I, I think all of us know know Americans or people living in America who have suffered from from that kind of grief. Yeah. At the same time it's part of the richness of our culture here that we have those people and that they have, you know, come with their grief <laughs> to us, you know, so. Several of your stories play out like scenes of a short film um, with little vignettes and the movement of characters and, and the way you describe them. Um, do you think of them that way in your mind? Do you kind of tease those scenes out with shots and everything included as you write? Can you tell us <laughs> a little bit about that process? Oh, that's that's a great question. Um, yeah, I do. I do see a lot when I'm writing, uh, sort of like I'm hovering above <laughs> and looking at it as, as though it were a film. I don't feel my writing is always visual enough. I have, I, 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 you know, that's something that I struggle with, but I'm definitely seeing it. I may not be capturing it um, as visually as I would like to, but I, I definitely definitely am seeing it yes and vignettes um yeah I think I think in vignettes a lot of, a lot of times and yes there are many vignettes I think in, in my work the story Havala Havala Hamli Havala Hamli thank you so much I apologize to everybody um offers a harrowing description of a refugee camp how did you research this? You have touched a little bit on this earlier and other aspects of this work that may have not been based, on, obviously, on personal experience. It was based on personal experience. Oh, okay. I, I, was, I was a volunteer uh, interpreter at a refugee camp just for a short period of time, but it was enough to, to I, I will never um, be able to unsee some of the things I saw there. And uh, that, that, that what actually happens in the story isn't 100% true, but I did meet that woman. Um, and I was in, I was interpreting at, uh, in a medical center. So I was, you know, I was a Farsi interpreter at, at the clinic in the refugee camp. And that woman did come in one night and she, um, yes. And I, I got to know her and she's actually now in Finland. So the story has a happy ending. Um, but yes, and I did research also, but I, uh, the, most of the research was on the ground. I, I was there now yeah, in 2016, I was in, in Lesbos. Yes. And, you know, there are still, yeah, I don't know the exact count, but there's still so many displaced people in the world and and, and refugees, um, Afghan, Syrians, <laughs> Palestinians, you name it. We don't realize how lucky we are. Even if we're, even if we bring grief with us to the United States, we don't realize how lucky we are that we have a home. Yeah. And that, you know, we're safe. You touched on this in your last story. Do you think it's possible for us to go home again? Hmm. I think it depends on the, the situation in our country. I think maybe with the, although maybe I'm giving myself a little too much power here, but with the publication of this book, I think I would be afraid to go home again. Um, because it is, although not overtly so, it is obviously critical of, of the current regime in Iran. So it depends on one's circumstances. But I think once you have uh, found a new home and put down roots, going home again is not ever going to be the same. You know, and at my age, and and especially because of the huge paradigm shift in my country's trajectory, my my home is not there anymore. Okay, so the Iran that I grew up in is long gone. So um, even if I were to go back home, it would not be my home anymore. So that's a really really important question, and I don't know exactly how to answer it. Um, I think it would it would be it would depend on the individual and the place they're trying to go back to. But in general, I would say no. It's not possible to go home again. Yeah, a home is a place in time, perhaps. Yeah, yes. it's it's not it's not able to be recaptured because mm -hmm. of the time aspect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so. yes. Yeah. So, um, this is your debut collection. What are you working on right now? Well, I've I've always had the idea that I would like to write a novel. I'm I'm not um, 
I don't know, I'm much more of a short fiction writer, but I am trying to, I've got a vision for a novel. Actually, I actually have a draft of a novel um, that's based on my mom, who's an American who, uh, you know, moved to Iran uh, after she married my dad. But I'm thinking about writing about aging, because that is something that I am living. Um, and so my, and I spend a lot of time at my mom's nursing home. So my next idea for a novel starts at a nursing home in the United States. Um, I've written maybe 25 pages and then notes here and there um so maybe it'll end up being a collection of stories i don't know <laughs> but you know what i'm 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 67 so i you know i don't know if another novel this one took this one was a long time in coming it took about 10 years to write it from start to finish so <laughs> that would put me in uh you know that, that put me at a very advanced age but but i do write all the time and i don't think i'll be able to to stop whether it will turn into something publishable or not remains to be seen but yeah I've one of the writers I greatly, greatly admire, who I had the great privilege of working with in um when I was at BU was is Sigrid Nunes. And I think she writes so, even though it's not directly a subject in, in her a topic in her stories, she writes so beautifully about aging. And I so admire that. And when I read read her work, it just uh, it just pulls at my heartstrings all over the place because it's very a very tender depiction of of aging. Yeah. I don't know if I can do that or not, but, but I, but I'm experiencing it, the process. So I, <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Would you like to read from Zan from our audience? So uh, like I said, the back of my book says there are three kinds of women that I am depicting in these stories or, or, or trying to, you know, um, to open windows into their lives. Those who are in Iran, those who are in the United States and those who are in between. So I had chose a brief excerpt from, from stories that, that cover each of those. So the first one is from the from the story Stealthy Freedom. And I'm gonna pull that up. I'm, I'm gonna keep it short. So this is from the story Stealthy Freedom, and it is set in Iran, and it is a moment when a woman decides that she's going to rip off her headscarf and film herself in public. Without pausing to think, she reaches up and with a single deft motion, pulls her headscarf down around her shoulders and frees her hair from the butterfly clip. The clip falls to the ground and she leaves it there. She points her cell phone camera at her made up face, at her full red lips, at her hair. She can't feel a breeze, so she shakes her head from side to side to show the full effect of her loose hair. Still training the cell phone on herself, she uses her free hand to unbutton her rupush, points the camera at her upper body, and films her tight-fitting blouse. Just as she's about to film her hair again, a breeze starts up, as if on cue. She lifts the scarf from her shoulders and holds it aloft until it catches the wind, then lets it go, filming it as it rises toward the treetops. Then she points the camera back at her face, films her smile, and pushes the red button at the bottom of her screen. A few meters away on the playground, a child gives a frightened cry and begins running toward the park benches. Sari freezes for a moment, but then she notices that the other children are looking up at her with wonder and expectation on their faces. One of them, a girl of about 10 who is wearing a school-issued hijab, begins clapping. Slowly, hesitantly, a few other children join in. She turns the cell phone toward the playground and films the children. Now, suddenly, the people on either side of the playground are in motion. She was wrong. There are far more than 20 people here. She's surrounded by them, and she has the sudden awareness that they are closing in on her, not to harm her, but to protect her. Some begin clapping, and others point their cell phones in her direction to film her. Before long, the roar of clapping hands is all around her. It's coming from the playground, from the cluster of benches, from a stone walkway, even from the street. It occurs to her that this is the first time in her life she has received applause from perfect strangers. Emboldened now, she shouts, post this on Instagram, post it on Facebook, send it to everyone you know. So that's the first excerpt. Uh, the second one is from a story that takes place in the United States. This is an, a, a, this is an odd story. It's the, it's the story of an encounter between an Iranian woman and an American man that she met at a, a support group um, who shows up on her doorstep one day. So, and this is just a, a brief dialogue between the two of them. After his fourth screwdriver and her second, they found themselves seated on the Persian rug with their backs against the couch. Ethan took a long sip of his drink and then looked at her with a challenge in his eyes. Okay, so I need to know why someone like you, with your looks, your brains, and your money, ends up in an EA support group. 
Although it was obvious that the question was a serious one, Azita, who was feeling a bit lightheaded, chose to answer him teasingly. I think it goes back to the moment of my conception. I was conceived during an Iraqi bombing raid on Tehran. There were almost nightly bombing raids back then, and my parents, who were newlyweds at the time, had to go down to the basement to take cover. On the night I was conceived, the bombing raid was really intense, and I guess the fear must have stoked my parents' passion. I don't quite follow, said Ethan. How does being conceived in a basement lead to a support group 30 years later? I don't know. I guess I was born angry. As you know, those Iraqi bombs that almost killed my parents were manufactured by the U.S., like most of the bombs in the world. When my mom first told me the story as a child, I remember feeling a sense of panic at the thought that my parents might have died and might, I might never have come into being. When I thought about it later, after I understood where babies came from, I started seeing my parents as anti-imperialist heroes. Even the sperm and the egg had fought valiantly against the evil American empire, the great Satan, as they call it in Iran. Anger was almost a part of my DNA. Ethan looked thoughtful. I think your theory contains a glaring contradiction. The way I look at it, you should be grateful for American military might. You owe your very existence to it. You've got a point, she responded. And the last story is from the baboon, which we've already talked about. And this is the the this a, a woman, ta Iranian woman, taking her Iran, her American husband to Iran for the first time. And this this scene takes place in the airport, uh, in the airplane. Sorry, as they are descending toward the airport. The last time she visited Iran, she was a mere child and didn't have to bother with a hijab. But this time, as the plane was descending toward the Imam Khomeini airport, she was forced to go into the tiny toilet to transform herself before she, before she could enter her country as a woman. In her purse, she carried a makeshift from Pushu Sari. The headscarf was fashioned from a dull gray fabric remnant she bought at Walmart, and she found an old raincoat to use as a substitute for a rupush, leaving the sash open to avoid accentuating the contours of her body. When she leaned in close to examine her reflection in Plain's distorted bathroom mirror, she barely recognized herself. She looked like a nun wearing a mismatched habit. She caught Andrew's eye as she navigated the aisle back toward her seat. She could tell that he was startled by the transformation, but true to form, he covered his reaction with an attempt at humor. He flashed her a mock salacious smile as she sat down beside him. Wow, you look amazing, he whispered. Makes me want to rip all those clothes off and see what's underneath. Nice try, Andrew. You know I look ridiculous, she answered. She was so aware of how ridiculous she looked that she could feel her face burning as they entered the terminal and walked down the long corridor toward border control. Andrew had not undergone a transformation before entering the airport, but somehow he looked ridiculous too. He was a full head taller than most of the other passengers, and his blonde hair, which swirled around his head like a lion's mane, seemed to be a defiant proclamation of his alien presence in the dark-haired crowd. Even when the Border Patrol subjected Andrew to an interrogation, he remained as calm as the Sphinx. Which side will you fight on in the war? Which war? The one that's coming. The United States against and Israel against Iran. Neither side. Roya's heart pounded so violently when she translated this exchange that she felt certain it was visible beneath her rupush. Her Farsi was rusty after so many years, and seeing a Kalashnikov rifle at such close range didn't help to put her at ease but the customs official had been too fascinated by Andrew to pay much attention to her nervousness or her grammar. His face broke into a toothy smile as he welcomed them both to Iran, sending them directly under the stadium-sized banner that read, Mag Bar Amrika, Death to America. Wow, that's so evocative. Thank you so much for that great reading. And thank you, Susie Atisham Zadeh, for joining us today. Great pronunciation. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. And uh, your book is Zan, correct? Mm -hmm. And it is published by Zen. Thanks again, Susie. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Nice to meet you all. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you.